Thank you so much for this kind award and for having me here today. I'm delighted to accept an award that honors grit and determination for women who strive to make a difference. This, of course, is the story of so many women, and so I thought today I could talk about the crucial role that women play in our storytelling and in our business success. Let's start with one fact and one photo. Here's the fact. I'm the 10th person to become editor-in-chief of National Geographic and the first woman. And here's the photo. Now, I like this image so much that it hangs in my office. Sometimes I view it with a sense of wonder. I can hardly believe my incredible good fortune to occupy this position. Sometimes it makes me a little depressed. It's visual proof of how long it can take for women to get ahead. And sometimes it makes me laugh because it looks like what they say on Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the others. But mostly when I look at this picture, I'm reminded of the power of visual storytelling. Without reading a word, you understand the backstory here. And that's something we think a lot about at National Geographic, because the words and images we choose can change perceptions in significant ways. That's especially true when we do stories about groups that are underrepresented or marginalized, groups such as women and people of color. This is what I'd like to share today. I'll show you how we tell stories about women and how those depictions in the last century have changed as dramatically as the lives of the women themselves. It's truly impressive how far we've come, how resilient we've been. And with that as inspiration, then let's talk about how to envision and create success in our own lives and careers. Let me start with something I'm very proud of. This book, Women Across the Globe Are Demanding Their Rights, and we've recently had the 100th anniversary of women getting the vote in the United States. So National Geographic took this opportunity to look at how women have been shown and seen over the past 132 years. The book is drawn from Nat Geo's archives, which today hold 64 million print and digital images. As the archive grew, we ended up creating a global chronicle of the lives of women in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. The upshot is this volume focused on women in 450 photos, 512 pages, and in a volume that weighs six pounds. These pictures are snapshots of their times, revealing how women were seen, how they were perceived, how much power they had or didn't have. The images show what used to be called a woman's place. It's a concept that's changing before our eyes. The caption on this photo says, photographer unknown, Zulu bride and bridegroom. It is the very first image National Geographic ran in which a woman is the subject of a photo. The year is 1896, eight years after we started publishing. We then see women as exotic, beautiful creatures, like this photo from 1932. In traditional roles, like this washing children photo taken in the mid-1930s. We've got smiley photos from the 1940s and 50s. But finally, we start to see real emotions, like this grieving mother in Bulgaria, taken in 1978, and real anger, like this 1982 Jerusalem picture. We see women doing things we never saw them doing before, such as this photo from India from the early 1980s, and this gamekeeper photo taken in Kenya just a few years ago. And we see women now getting educated, this wonderful picture is from Spelman College in 2018. These photos change over the decades not only because what the women were doing changed, but because of who's behind the camera. We have many more female photographers now, and I think it's fair to say that the female gaze sees a different world than that's seen by many men. So this is one way to tell the story of women a narrative arc that takes us from ornamental object to future leader. You can see these changes on the cover of our magazine as well. We start with this pretty, painted, utterly decorative photo from 1959. This is the first woman on our cover. 
The woman is so unimportant, we don't even know her name, although some people believe that she was the wife of the photographer. We go from there to the first cover that focused on a working woman from 1964, a Peace Corps volunteer. Then we've got a famous female scientist, Jane Goodall, in 1965, in a photo that also shows off her beautiful legs, which is probably not an accident. Then eventually, we get the direct stares of two very different women who, in their own ways, tell us about the place women are occupying in different countries, in different centuries, and with vastly different opportunities. Here's Afghan Girl. This cover is from 1985, and the woman pictured, then a 13-year-old, is named Sharbat Gula. This photo brought attention to the plight of refugees in a way nothing else could have. To this day, it remains one of the most recognized images in the world and is no doubt our most famous cover ever. More than 30 years later, in 2018, we featured Peggy Whitson on our cover, the brave U.S. astronaut who holds our record for the most cumulative time spent in space. In November 2019, in conjunction with the book, we published a special issue of National Geographic magazine, looking at the state of women all over the globe. It's the first issue in our history that is written, photographed, and illustrated entirely by women. We looked at the power women have achieved in places from Rwanda to the United States. Now, we actually thought about changing the border of the magazine for this special issue, though we backed off after a vigorous internal debate. But even as we celebrate women's achievements, it's never been more important to shine a light on the harsh, constrained lives of many women and girls. In places like Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, and so many other countries, they live with rights denied, opportunities withheld, contributions ignored, and vulnerabilities exploited. Women like 17-year-old baby Sabure, pictured here with her child and her 48-year-old husband in Sierra Leone. In 130 years of covering cultures around the world, we've witnessed again and again how inequality can become invisibility until the oppressed can hardly be seen or heard at all. With this book and our special issue of the magazine, and with all of our growing coverage of women, our goal is to bring more women's lives into the light and more women's voices into the conversation. That's one of our goals at National Geographic, to be part of the conversation. And the conversation about gender is changing as we speak. We did a special issue on this topic in 2017 it was called Gender Revolution, and it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. One of the reasons it connected so powerfully is that we looked at gender's impact from very early in life among boys, girls, and people on the gender spectrum. This is how we came to meet Avery Jackson, a nine-year-old transgender girl from Kansas City who looked straight into the camera and said something profound. She said, the best thing about being a girl is now I don't have to pretend to be a boy. We put her on the cover, the first time a transgender person has ever been on the cover of National Geographic. And I have to tell you that almost nothing I have done in my 42-year career has touched me as much as the reaction we got to that decision. So many people have told me that because we did this, they were able to have conversations in their own families they didn't think they could have had before. And this brings me to what we can do to make a difference. As part of the Women Book, I had the honor of talking to 25 of today's most accomplished, amazing women. We posed the same 11 questions to all of them about everything from what needs to happen to give women equal opportunity to the challenges they've faced in their own lives. The answers to two of these questions were remarkably consistent, one positive and one sobering. The sobering one had to do with issues of confidence. So many of these talented, famous women told me about the struggles with their own sense of self-worth. Jacinda Ardern, New Zealand's 40th Prime Minister, was juggling her job and a baby 
and then became a global sensation when she demanded gun control after 50 people were shot to death in a mosque in Christchurch. When we asked her what was her biggest hurdle, she said, myself, I am my own biggest hurdle. No one will be a bigger critic of me than me. I think many women are much harsher on themselves and on their abilities, and I'm one of them. What's Oprah Winfrey's biggest hurdle? She answered immediately, pleasing other people, the disease to please. It's our curse and it happens when we are not raised to know our own value and our own worth. Now, Jennifer Doudna is a DNA scientist who came up with a gene editing technique that's been called the most significant scientific breakthrough of the past century. Yet she told me about the many doubts she had in herself, wondering, do I really have the ability to become a biochemist and a successful scientist? And she said, there were a number of times when I was younger when I thought the answer was no. On the other hand, I was so encouraged by what these women said so consistently about the advice they give to younger women or would give to their own younger selves. What they said speaks volumes about the reinvention of the concept of a woman's place. Jennifer Doudna, that brilliant scientist who worried she wasn't good enough, her advice now is, walk into a room like you own the place. A man would do that without compunction. Roxane Gay is a best-selling author who writes about the intersections of race, gender, and pop culture. She's weathered abuse from trolls because of her body type and because she's an African-American woman and is bisexual. Let me tell you, there is no way the trolls will beat her down. Young women have to be able to stand up for themselves and advocate for themselves without fear, she said. It's important for young women to embrace their ambition and to know their worth and to ask for it. Alex Morgan is the World Cup winning soccer player and Olympic gold medalist. She says, women need to feel unapologetic about going after their dreams. Don't be discouraged in your journey. If people talk badly about you, if people say you can't achieve something, let it drive you and steer you forward. And finally, Alicia Garza, one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, said this, and I love her quote, my greatest strength is my ability to ignore it when I get no for an answer. When people say it cannot be done, there's something that goes off inside me that says, okay, watch me. And that's exactly how I feel. My journey of empowerment began in 1980, between my junior and my senior years of college, when I was a summer reporting intern at the Seattle Post-Intelligencer. At the end of my eight-week internship, the editor came up to me. Kid, he said, do you want to stay? And I really did want to stay more than anything, but there was a terrifying phone call I had to make. I had to call my father, who is a professor at the University of Michigan. And so I did. And I said, Pop, I am dropping out of college and I'm gonna stay here as a reporter at the Seattle Post-Intelligencer. And then my father said the two sentences that I least expected to hear. Good for you, Susan. We're very proud of you. And that's when my real life began. This was my father's gift to me. It would be years before I truly understood how big a gift it was or how hard it must have been for him to give it. His permission, even more his endorsement of my choice, gave me the confidence to set me on my path. It gave me confidence in my 20s to stand up to sexist lawmakers who tried to brush me off when I was the first woman to cover the Michigan legislature for the Detroit Free Press. It gave me confidence in my 30s to stretch for editing and management jobs I truly wasn't sure I could handle at USA Today. Confidence at 39 to rise to my life's toughest moment, the death of my first husband. Five months after he died, I moved alone across the country to become the first woman managing editor and later the first woman editor of the San Jose Mercury News. Because of all of these experiences, good and bad, I found the confidence in my 50s to leave Bloomberg News, 
leave a well-paid, prestigious job, take a pay cut, and join National Geographic, where I thought I could help make the world a better place. That was a good decision. My younger self would not believe how things have turned out, especially now that we're part of the Walt Disney Company. Even my 62-year-old self sometimes cannot quite believe it. Earlier, I showed you a photo I have on my office wall, the one with me and all the men who preceded me as Editor-in-Chief. Now that tells one kind of story. But there's another photo I have on the wall, and it's there as pure inspiration. This is Marine Corporal Gabrielle Green in a picture taken by female combat photographer, Lindsay Adario. You can see that Corporal Green has slung a 200 pound man over her shoulder and she is marching up a steep ramp in a readiness drill before deployment. She looks strong. She looks determined. She looks tough as hell. On one of her amazing thighs is a tattoo that says, the fire inside me burns brighter than the fire around me. Talk about words to live by. Now, I have never met Gabrielle Green, but I have built an entire story around her. Every day, I look at her and ascribe to her the values I want to embody. One of them is literal, to lift others up. There is no way she is dropping that guy. But I see so much more in her. Character, fortitude, outward calm. She's someone who gets the job done. She is a leader. And I see an underappreciated trait too that so many women have, resiliency. She is gonna keep walking up that ramp no matter what happened the day before, no matter what comes tomorrow. When I look at my life story, I see resiliency as the single greatest factor in what I've been able to achieve. Being resilient means we keep trying. We say yes to things that scare us. We don't give up, we show up. We keep marching up that ramp. I haven't led an Instagram perfect life or an easy life or a life where the way forward was always straight or clear. But I have led a resilient life, thanks in part to the guidance and inspiration of people ahead of me on this journey. Can't most of you say the same? It's the kind of support Melinda Gates described during our interview in her advice to young women. She said, seek out people and environments that empower you to be nothing but yourself. When I think about the state of women today, I see great success and great progress toward equality. We've come a long way from the voiceless, decorative women seen in those early National Geographic images. But we can never forget that elsewhere in the world, that's still too many women's fate. Today, for us, I think we can agree. We are not yet at the top of that ramp. There's still a long way to go. But we women are blazing our own trails to get there. And we will get there, helping each other. The fire inside us burns bright. Thank you.